You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Tuesday. April 30th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, professor of history at Northwestern University, Daniel Immerwar on how to hide an empire, a history of the greater United States. Also on the program today, impeachment talk increases as Trump stonewalling increases, including a lawsuit against Deutsche Bank and Capital One to block release of financial records to Congress. <clears throat> Also on the program today, Trump to charge refugees fees for asylum. Rod Rosenstein resigns, praising Donald Trump's good humor. And Mike Pompeo praises our involvement in the Yemen slaughter. Meanwhile, Joe Biden staking out the Republican lane in the Democratic primary. And Democrats fight to maintain the promise of loan relief for public workers. And in Ohio, Ohio Republicans remind us that the problem is Republicans. And lastly, the U.S. cheers on an attempted coup going down right about now in Venezuela. All this and more... On today's program, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the program. Everyone's uh, here today. Uh, Jamie is back from her. Uh, where, did, where did you go, Jamie? Um, first, I went upstate to work on my book proposal and freak out about that. And then I went to the 24 hour drone festival, which was, as always, a transcendent experience. I don't even know what that means. What it's, does that mean? Like, oh, um, drone music. Oh, okay. It's like um, any thought, repeating I you tone. Were saying, I thought you were saying. Not the kind that fly in the sky. I think you the made sky. the same mistake last year, actually. I did? Yeah. I guess I didn't pick up that. Where is the drone, uh, where is the drone festival? It's at Basilica Hudson, which is a beautiful former factory building owned right. by Melissa Aftermar and her filmmaker husband. I know that place it's very, very well. Cool. My daughter has gone to camp. Right next to the Basilica. Oh, my it, God. Yeah, I didn't realize. This this one, my, I mean, my experience was not for kids, I'll tell you that much, this I past can, weekend. I can only imagine. Not for beginners. I can only imagine. All right, uh, folks, a um, couple, uh, couple of emails I got from, uh, from listeners uh, that I want to uh, share with you uh, because uh, longtime listeners, both. Uh, one is from listener Alex. Hey, I'm our crew. It's my brother's, uh, Spencer's birthday, and I was hoping you could give him a shofar. He did the same for my birthday, and it made my day. We are both daily listeners and members. He was going to get me a membership for my birthday, but found out I had already joined. Keep fighting the good fight. Pajama boys and girls left his best. And I'm going to combine that uh, shofar with one from a film fest guy, longtime listener, um, associated with the... um, uh, film archives. Um, could I have a birthday shout out? It was my 50th this past Saturday. Welcome. Welcome to it, buddy. Uh, and to uh, both you guys. Happy birthday. Thanks for your continued listenership. Much appreciated. Um, all right, let's go to this. Um, ben Shapiro. Still on the um it seems like every every week he's got a new favorite freshman woman congress uh congressperson that he is obsessing about. I think Ilhan's his favorite. favorite Ilhan though. is his favorite now. Well, because, you know, um 
in the attempt to deny the obvious truth that hate crimes against Muslims, against Jews, um, against really anybody who is um, not white in this country or not Christian has gone up since the uh, <clears throat> entrance into the race by Donald Trump. And the Republican Party, which enabled Donald Trump's rise, which trained its, um, its electorate to vote for a guy like this, that has excused time and time again rhetoric that ranges from, I'm sure there's some decent non-rapist Mexicans to, uh, you know, we're going to ban the Muslim countries, uh, Muslim immigrants. Dude, just we're going to charge refugees uh, money if they're seeking asylum uh, and on and on and on. I'm sure there are good people on both sides, the whole thing. In their desperate attempt to hide their and deny their own complicity in this stuff, whether they dress it up as like, we're, we're just exploring ideas here. We're rebels. We're talking about stuff that was, you know, <clears throat> hasn't been as popular since we were talking about uh, eugenics or something. Um, they are constantly looking for other people to blame for what they know ultimately is a function of their politics. And here is uh, Ben Shapiro trying to somehow tie Ilan Omar into the white supremacist who um, who shot up a synagogue a couple of days ago. As I said before, if you are blind to anti-Semitism from one particular side of the aisle because it favors your political position, you are not in the fight against anti-Semitism. You are part of the problem. If anti-Semitism is just another political club to be wielded, if Ilhan Omar... Pause it. You know, it's just amazing because I, I, one could... Uh, be forgiven for assuming that that was the way he was about to introduce his apology. Right. <laughs> when anti-Semitism is just simply used as a political club, and with that said, I had an epiphany last night, and I'm going to retire, and I'm going to go uh, work somewhere else and do something else with my life, because I realize what I have been doing has been so wrong. But instead, he turns to Ilan Omar. You're part of the problem. If anti-Semitism is just another political club to be wielded, if Ilhan Omar is given the credibility to speak out against anti-Semitism while routinely engaging in anti-Semitism, she has a lot of the same opinions about Jews that the white supremacist had in that manifesto. In that manifesto, the, basi- the, the, white, the, the shooter basically says, effectively says about Jews, that they control the world media, that they control the way money runs, that they control opinion about Israel. Am I right, going to pause, take- pause it. Now, Alan Omar has said none of those things. None of, none of the things she's ever said could even be re- remotely interpreted by that. The closest she's ever said is that the um, PAC that is, has in its mission statement to impact the, uh, to impact the uh, public opinion of Israel in this country does it by expending money on candidates. Just like Thomas Friedman said, although Thomas Friedman said it a little more aggressively and a little more pointedly and a little bit more studiously. But she she never said any of the things he's lying about now. So just think how decrepit you have to be in your brain to make this case that we shouldn't politicize anti-Semitism as you are lying to politicize anti-Semitism and basically comparing Ilan Omar to a white supremacist who has just shot somebody up because, and he has to lie about the similarities in their manifesto. And I want you to keep that in mind. We don't need to hear Ben Shapiro anymore because Ben Shapiro, when we talk about manifestos, when we talk about the implications, and he's right, I don't know what the point is he's making that Ilan Omar, and he lies about her opinions, are, are similar to those of the, um, the shooter. But we know for a fact that the guy who shot up 
Uh, in Canada, which number is this one that we have here? Um, the Quebec City uh, mosque shooter. In the Washington Post, the guy's name, Bizonette, appears to have obsessively visited the Twitter accounts of Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram, David Duke, Alex Jones, Mike Cernovich, Richard Spencer, and Bizonette checked on the Twitter account of Ben Shapiro 93 times in the month leading up to the shooting. So if you want to talk about similarities in perspective, if you want to talk about inspiration for... uh, for attacks like these. Here's a, a video. Who did this video? This is a clip from uh, Vic Berger. Vic Berger did a video comparing the rhetoric from Shapiro with the testimony, not the testimony, the I guess the uh, interrogation of this guy, Bizonette. Listen to this. Many Muslims are trying to kill Jews. End of story. This idea, we are all Muslim, No, we aren't. And the only people who think we are are leftists who are fully insane or Muslims who believe that we all should be Muslims and that they get to kill us if we disagree. So all of this politically correct nonsense, it's going to get a lot of people killed. They're coming for Western civilization. A lot more people will die because there are people who believe we are all Muslims. Here's Bizonette. I wanted to save people. Save people, they ask? Yes. From terrorist attacks. How many Americans have died for this crap? I mean, the, the, um, I, I don't know if I can say that, that uh, Shapiro uh, inspired this guy, but we do know in terms of factually, this guy was obsessively checking the messages he was getting from Shapiro and that his perspective, his fears <laughs> um, were completely aligned with the warnings that Shapiro was giving. If so it, it's really stunning for this guy to come out and say this type of stuff. If we're talking about manifestos, I actually read the one from the uh, New Zealand guy. And uh, I would like to see Ben Shapiro explicitly say how his views on the dangers of Muslim immigration differ from those expressed in those manifestos. That would be very interesting to hear. I mean, uh, it's, it's pretty shocking to hear Ben Shapiro going out and trying to make this argument. Um, yeah, and he can stop using all Jews as an excuse, by the way, because most Jews do not agree with him. Well, he would not, to be fair, he would not consider those Jews to be Jews. Because Ben Shapiro, um, completely inconsistent with, the, uh, with Jewish tradition, feels that he is the Pope of the Jews, apparently. I'm the Pope of the Jews. Or he certainly, uh, it appears to act that way. The most piousness. Uh, folks, reminder, New Yorker a magazine represents the best writing in America today. Both online and in print, the New Yorker covers a full range of topics, including politics, news, international affairs, climate change, popular culture, the arts, fiction, food, humor, cartoons, not to mention the New Yorker touches on subjects that many readers may not have previously put much thought into, like the world's diminishing supply of sand. Or paper jams, or stink bugs. I think about stink bugs quite a bit, actually. Hunting down heirloom beans. Some of the New Yorker's incredible writers include contributors like Ronan Farrow, who broke the news on Harvey Weinstein and Les Moonves. And Helen Rosner, a James Beard award winning food writer, contributes essays and reports stories on all things gastronomic. We spoke about a New Yorker story yesterday involving the. Um, the sort of the, the grift that is the NRA. You can go check out a profile on John Bolton uh, that's in the, the piece now. Basically, um, his attempt, Bolton's attempt to sell uh, Donald Trump on neoconservatism again. Um, there's a piece on the return of uh, al Baghdadi from ISIS. Um, there is, uh, things, uh, billionaires and Jack Dorsey's Ted interviewer uh, interview. That's the guy from Twitter. That uh, was very informational. I bet. Extremely so. We're all in good hands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. Anyways, 
Uh, if you're not reading The New Yorker, you really, you're not reading anything, frankly. Uh, and now our listeners can save 50% and get 12 weeks of The New Yorker for just six bucks when you go to newyorker.com slash majority and enter the coupon code majority. You also get an exclusive tote as well as unlimited access to the New Yorker's apps, online archive, crossword puzzle, and newyorker.com with 10 to 15 exclusive site-only stories every day. That's newyorker.com slash majority. Enter majority. 50% off. 12 weeks in the New Yorker for just six bucks. Give me a break. Um, Also, uh, as you know, Third Love, a... um, Sponsor of this program. They have more than 70 sizes, including their signature half cup sizes. Third Love designs bras with breast size and shape in mind for a perfect fit, premium feel. You just answer a few simple questions via Third Love's Fit Finder quiz to find your perfect fit in 60 seconds. Then, thanks to Third Love's 100% fit guarantee, you can wear, wash, and put your bra to the test for 60 days. And if you don't love it, You can return it, and Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. This is, hands down, the most comfortable bra you'll own. Our official uh, tester writes, the fit is great. I usually have to return most bras I order online. Even though they're in my size, I ordered two, and both fit. That almost never happens. Super comfortable for an everyday bra, but not as boring as most T-shirt bras. Subtle, cute details, so I don't feel basic. They have straps that won't slip, tagless labels, lightweight, super thin memory foam cups. Not to mention, they have a new line of incredibly soft, smooth, and breathable cotton bras. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now, they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash majority now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash majority for 15% off today. And lastly, Mother's Day is coming up. And there's nothing we wouldn't do to make sure the special moms in our lives are happy. Shari's Berries has a special Mother Day Berries designed just for mom. They're topped with chocolate chips, pink shimmer sugar, and swizzles. They're beautiful, folks. And you choose your delivery date to ensure that mom gets you your gift to Shari Berries exactly when you want her to. Better yet, your satisfaction is always guaranteed. Folks, we've gotten uh, many shipments of Shari's Berries here. I'm literally. Um, yang, 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 yang. Yeah, maybe I'm, someday I'll get to try one before maybe. you eat them. I all. like maybe, them so maybe, much. Maybe. Hello. I do have a bit of a problem with eating uh, just one of them. Uh, they are uh, delicious, and I wish I had more right now. Uh, but it's a great gift for mom. Don't wait to the last minute one, on this one, folks. Visit berries.com to order freshly dipped strawberries starting at nineteen ninety nine for moms in your life. And you can, you can determine when they get delivered. So do it today so you don't forget. You only got about 10 days until Mother's Day. Less. Wait, what's today? No, about 10 days. 12 days. Uh, to make mom really happy, you can double the berries for just 10 bucks more. Mother's Day is Sunday, May 12th. So visit berries.com. That's B-E-R-R-I-E-S dot com. Then click on the microphone in the upper right-hand corner. Enter my code CEDAR. As in Seder, as in S-E-D-E-R, that's berries.com. Click on the microphone, code Cedar S-E-D-E-R. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we're going to be talking uh, to uh, Daniel Imawar on his book titled, Oy, where did I get it? Right here. How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States. We'll be right back.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of History at Northwestern University, Daniel Imavar, uh, author of How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, all right. So let's uh, just uh, as an overview, this is a a almost a, like a geographic history of of the of the empire of the United States. Why? What, what I guess what, what is it about knowing the geography as you track it over the course of of, of a couple hundred years uh, that is so important to our understanding of of America as um, as an entity? I guess. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, I, I start the book with maps, and one of the reasons I do that is that, frankly, I think a lot of people in the United States and a lot of people outside of the United States don't really have an accurate map of the full borders of the country in their head. So, you know, if you ask most people, what does the U.S. look like on a map? They call to mind that familiar shape, um, just the contiguous blob with Mexico and uh, uh, Canada on the north and south and the oceans on either side. Uh, but the thing is, those have only been the borders of the United States for three years of its history. There's three years of U.S. history where those are the borders, partly because in the 18th and early 19th century, the United States was expanding. Uh, but because after it stopped sort of expanding in the contiguous North America, it started expanding overseas, taking first uninhabited islands in the Caribbean and the Pacific, in the Caribbean and the Pacific, uh, and then you know taking large inhabited colonies. By the end of the 19th century, it had a, a very large and populous empire, and those overseas parts of the United States, both the colonies and then later on the military bases, uh, hundreds of them that the United States claims, those are I think just don't really feature in most people's maps of the country, and as a result, they tell a truncated version of its history, a history that only is interested and only focuses on the mainland, and they miss a lot of the action when they do that. And does it, and, and, and do we also, um, does it have implications in terms of the character of, of the country? I mean, uh, that, that we don't fully grasp the history, but do we not fully grasp, you know, I guess the I don't know. I'm just thinking, you know, we're we're obviously it's primary season. And so uh, we have a lot of candidates who talk about America as an idea. Uh, and yeah. I'm not sure I 100 percent know what that means. But um, yeah, does it implicate that idea? I think it does, um, because the vision that you get of the United States, if you're just looking at what people in the territories call the mainland, uh, first of all, it's a vision where uh, Republican ideals hold not perfectly, but fairly well. Most people live in parts of the United States that allow them to vote, that allow them to have um, sort of vote vote for representatives in Congress. Now, that's not true in D.C., uh, so there are some little uh, an anomalies, and, and um, Native American lands have their own sort of legal arrangements. Um, nevertheless, you kind of feel like it's wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in terms of the Republican system. Uh, once you look at the other parts of the United States, uh, the overseas parts, you realize that a big a big part of U.S. history uh, is 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 a peripheral zone, a zone that is uh, doesn't have uh, representation in terms of the ability to uh, vote for the president, uh, doesn't have the ability to vote for delegates who then have voting power in Congress, and in many cases isn't even covered by the Constitution. Uh, so that's disenfranchisement or subordination by all three modes of government. And that is, I think, a serious cognitive dissonance or contradiction between the ideals of the country as we often articulate them and the ideals as they're actually lived. Uh, I mean, I guess, and as we go through these sort of uh, these these eras, I mean, do we have a an accounting of, particularly in that respect, of the, uh, of, of the numbers that we're talking about? I mean, how does that translate in, from... And at, at, at maybe high and low points in terms of just how many of those uh, of of people are in that sort of um, that uh, that area of they're not sovereign, but they're not in any way represented. Sure. Uh, so we're at a relative low point right now. Uh, in you know, the United States still has five inhabited territories, and between three and four million people live in them. If you add Washington, D.C., that's, uh, you know, a few more hundred thousand people uh, without full representation, uh, the, the kind that uh, citizens living in states have. Um, but, you know, that's a relatively low point. Um, if you go back to 1940, uh, which is where I sort of open the book um, as I tell the story of how World War II comes to the territories. Uh, at that time, 
19 million people who live in the United States, 19 million people who are U.S. nationals live off the mainland outside of the states. And just for some perspective, uh, if you live in the United States, then there's a one in eight chance that you're colonized, that you live in the territories, uh, which means that you're more likely to be colonized than you are to be an immigrant. You're more likely to be colonized than you are to be African-American by odds of three to two. So this has been at various points, a very substantial part of the United States' population. And even at times when, um, even or even in places where the populations are kind of low, small islands, military bases, which are relatively small enclaves, um, those spaces, have also been really important to U.S. history um, beyond the, their effect of the people who live in them or right around them. I want to I want to start with, um, with, uh, with 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 Pearl Harbor and and and, and the, the story you tell about uh, FDR and the way that he was sort of framing this for the for the estates. But it occurs to me as you're saying that about that sort of the really stunning number of people who are you know I mean disenfranchised is almost like. Um, an underwhelming word in that context. When we add that with uh, with slavery, which where you had people obviously in um, in you know m- probably material uh, situations, uh, perhaps even more oppressed, but certainly um, the number of w- we have had in a an expansive history of having um, dominion or control over people without their having any participation in what we perceive as the idea of America, that has been sort of more the norm than not. Yeah, well, certainly it's been throughout U.S. history, every, you know, day of U.S. history. Um, there's some, you know, there's some version of this going on. You can find some moment when, uh, the promises may turn out to be restricted to, you know, in the 18th and 19th century to a white settler population rather than to the full population of all the land in North America, which includes Native Americans, which includes enslaved African Americans. Uh, yeah, and, but what's really important to recognize, I think, is that colonialism is one of those important Accesses of subordination. Actually, it's a really big one. Um, and so when we're talking about the ways in which people are disenfranchised or legally subordinated or sort of they don't count uh, within the, um, you know, uh, the sort of sense of Washington of, of who matters and who doesn't, uh, actually colonialism is, 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 a, is a fairly big chunk of that uh, and certainly is so, especially in the first half of the 20th century. So let's talk about um, uh, the the attack on on Pearl Harbor, which in fact, I mean, oh, yeah, please. well, I mean, you, you may, I, you know, I, I, I just found the whole thing sort of fascinating because I have always referred to it as the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, when in fact, in some respects, um, it was from, in terms of the war, it was not, it doesn't have the same relevance in terms of like, like uh, the, as all the other attacks that took place that day. Um, but, but we don't have that in our consciousness because of the way, because of, I guess, what, uh, the consciousness that Americans had of what constituted our territories at that time. Explain that. Yeah. So Pearl Harbor is not really the best name for what happened. And the reason it's not the best name for what happened is that, uh, the attack began for the United States with an attack on the naval base uh, Pearl Harbor in the territory of Hawaii, but it didn't stop there. Uh, in a near simultaneous attack, this all took place within hours. Uh, it's a little confusing because part of the attack took place on the other side of the international date line, and therefore it happened on December 8th, but this is all happening within a single, single solar day. Um, the J- Japan attacks uh, of the U.S. territories, Hawaii, Wake Island, which is an... Uh, not indigenously inhabited, but nevertheless occupied territory, Guam, and the single largest territory that the United States had ever held, which is the Philippines. And the the reason that Pearl Harbor is not a particularly great descriptor for all of that uh, is, first of all, it's not clear that that's even where the greatest military damage is done. The uh, damage to the Philippines is quite serious and takes out uh, the sort of pillar of air defense in the entire Pacific. But more importantly, The attack on Pearl Harbor is just an attack, whereas the attack on Guam, Wake Island, the Philippines, and then later Alaska, this wasn't in that day, but it happened, you know, within months, uh, was uh, a Japanese attack 
followed by more attacks, followed by invasion and occupation. And so, uh, you know, the largest colony that the United States had ever held, the Philippines, was occupied by Japan for years. It was a brutal occupation. And folks in the Philippines had a very different kind of war than people in Hawaii had. In, in, in fact, uh, by the end of, of World War II, Philippines had lost, what was it, 1.5 million people? or, 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 or 1.6. We, okay, so it depends on how you count. If you're asking how many Filipinos died in the Second World War, the government count is around 1.1 million. Uh, if you ask how many people died in the Philippines, and that so includes Japanese and that includes um, U.S. mainland service members, uh, then it goes up to 1.6 million. Uh, but just to clarify, that makes World War II in the Philippines, the bloodiest event that ever took place on U.S. soil. That's two civil wars. And yet you rarely hear about this in U.S. history textbooks because the kind of U.S. history uh, that we often do and teach in this country is a history of not the entire United States. It's a history of the mainland only. And so things that take place outside of the mainland don't seem to count as part of that history. And, and talk about how FDR addressed the country, the, uh, the United States, I guess the, the Americans, in, in, in sort of framing what happened on that day. And, like, you know, I guess the question I have, as you explain it, is, um, is it simply because, like, oh, this is not a teachable moment to explain <laughs> Um, how we've been, you know, how many territories we have, or is it that, um, like, w this is not the vision that we have of ourselves, and so we don't, I don't want to really push that at this moment. Yeah, so FDR faces a really interesting choice, and in fact, not just FDR. Anyone who's describing the attack, the attack that we now call Pearl Harbor, uh, in, in those, you know, hours and days after it is facing an interesting question, which is how to describe what happened. And we've got a term for it, Pearl Harbor, but they didn't have that term. Uh, that was the name of the military base, the naval base, but no one called the full attack Pearl Harbor in the way that we did. That didn't come out for a few days. So you can just go through the newspaper headlines and see editors try to put a descriptor to it or try to put a name to it or try to say what happened. And often, they would say that, well, a lot of things happened. Japan attacked Hawaii and Guam, or Japan attacked the Philippines and Hawaii. It wasn't clear where the focus needed to be. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt gave a speech the night before, uh, so before FDR's date, which will live in infamy speech, and she focused attention on Hawaii and the Philippines. And that's also how uh, the draft of FDR's uh, uh, famous speech went. Uh, FDR produced that draft, and it was about Japanese attacks on Hawaii and the Philippines. And then you can just see FDR noodling with the draft. And when I say you can see it, I mean literally, because we actually have his marked up successive copies and his emendations and his deletions. And uh, one thing he does is he takes out prominent references to the Philippines. He makes this a story about Hawaii. There's still a sort of back, uh, back page reference to the Philippines. Um, people don't always remember in that speech there. FDR gives a list of other places that Japan has attacked. It's an indiscriminate list, so it doesn't distinguish in any way between U.S. and foreign territory, and it's sort of tucked to the back of the speech. But nevertheless, the focus of that is on Hawaii, and it seems pretty clear to me why. I don't think F this is a sort of grand conspiracy, but I think what FDR is responding to is that there is very little support on the U.S. mainland for a military defense of the Philippines, which is uh, has a very small white population, is very far from the mainland, or for Guam. And there's more support, although even that is kind of wobbly, uh, for to, to uh, use the U.S. military to defend the territory of Hawaii, which has a larger, although not majority, white population. Uh, and you can see FDR worry about even Hawaii because the final uh, – edit he makes to the speech between the last draft that we have on paper and his, his actual spoken speech is that he, he inserts the word American in there before he describes the target in Hawaii, just to really underscore to his audience, and I think FDR was nervous about what his audience would hear, uh, that Hawaii might sound foreign, might feel foreign, but actually is American territory, and therefore a Japanese attack on it is a cause for war. So, all right, so let's go back and... and what 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 is the genesis of i mean the, i guess the genesis of um of the american empire begins as uh, uh the as as i guess settlers uh and colonialists uh, start to move west right what is the genesis of this sort of lack 
of awareness. I mean, it, it, and maybe maybe this is like a generic um, shyness about being an empire, but it, it doesn't, you know, like it seems to me like the British Empire was sort of, you know, they were pretty uh, psyched about making sure that everybody was aware <laughs> that they were an empire. I don't yeah. get the same, yeah. the, the, you don't get the same sense of, of American history in that way. Yeah. So two things. First of all, um, you're right that in some ways these questions of empire go back to day one, uh, literally to day one, in that the uh, right after the United States is formally independent from Britain, so the treaty has been ratified by both sides and now the country is independent, uh, its, its name is United States of America, which suggests that it's a union of states, but it's not. It's a union of, or it's not even a union, it's an amalgam of states and territories. The word union suggests voluntarily entered into. Uh, but the United States, from day one, has territories, uh, in this case, Western territories, uh, and will have territories every day, you know, until now. I mean, so every, every intervening day, it's, it's, it's always states and territories. Um, but at first, that's a, not a hidden kind of thing about the United States. People are very aware of it. The Civil War has a lot to do with the battle for slavery slavery in the territories, um, you know, candidates for president will talk about their sort of, you know, log cabin, you know, backcountry roots. I think the moment when the uh, imperial architecture of the United States becomes the kind of thing that has to be hidden uh, is when those territories are no longer uh, receptacles for the filling up with white settlers, uh, when they become large populous places uh, full of people who are perceived from the perspective of the mainland as non-white uh, and who can't just be dislodged by um, white settlers. And so th we're talking here about uh, territories like Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, Alaska, Guam, uh, and that kind of imperialism, the kind about you know, ruling distant populations, uh, the kind that Britain does so proudly, that's the kind that the United States never sort of or very rarely trumpets proudly. And, and for most of its history experiences is a, a sort of cognitive dissonance about, uh, you know, on the one hand, it has a vision of itself as, you know, a republic uh, where everyone has sort of some say in the government. On the other hand, the reality is that, you know, millions of people uh, live under this different kind of government. And that never quite fits in the same way that it fits easily into British political culture. Is that what it is? It's because that that reality um, butts up against the 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 I guess the the narrative of the character of of America, of the idea of America. And, and, and is it is it that and or is it also that um we're this is about resource extraction or about some type of like we need a base here well yeah it's interesting that the the colony the story of the united states overseas colonies is not largely a story of successful resource extraction uh there are sugar plantations and pineapple plantations and such uh but it's not like the united states depends for its absolute livelihood on its overseas territories it does in the later 20th century start to care a lot about um you know all of its military bases all over the planet uh but but why does it have large colonies it doesn't really it turn out to need them in some deep way. Um, nevertheless, there is a, there's a real contradiction between how the United States, which was born of an anti-colonial revolt, envisions itself, the kind of pattern that, had, that it had been in, in the 19th century, where it did, you know, states and territories, but it always, you know, or it, it intended to upgrade those territories to states once they were filled with large white populations. And then the kind of pattern that, you know, it acts out in the overseas territories, which doesn't quite fit that model and therefore um, doesn't, you know, can't be part of the sort of, uh, or, or doesn't turn out to be part of the national myth of the country. I, I want to go through, start going through the history, but, but, uh, but, uh, but I'm sort of hung up on like, what, so why was there so much of this? <laughs> like, what did we... So, well, so much of what? Of, of that, of, 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 main, of maintenance of territories. When we don't need the resources, was it we need the markets? Was it the... the I mean, because I know, you know, we have some dynamics where it's, you know, it gives us a little like... It, it's almost like Guantanamo Bay on some level that is a little bit extreme, but that's a model of what we use these territories for. Like it's outside of the purview of the United States, but we still have control so we can experiment with some stuff and maybe do stuff yeah, that's, yeah. you know, quasi legal, that type of thing. Well, so Guantanamo Bay is a pretty good example of this because, you know, now we think of Guantanamo Bay as, 
for the perspective of you know the United States and the national security apparatus. It has been a very useful space. It's this little part of Cuba that the United States has exclusive jurisdiction over and jurisdiction that is so complete, it's as if it were a sovereign, but it's not a sovereign. And that difference between not quite technically being a sovereign is what allows all kinds of legal things to happen or things that would be illegal if they were happening on U.S. soil. Uh, so you think of that as a very useful kind of space, but you have to realize that the United States had had Guantanamo Bay since the very early 20th century. And, you know, sometimes it had been it had been genuinely really useful. Other times it had been a little less so. And there's a kind of history of experimentation. What can be done with it? Uh, Haitians who are you know coming to the U.S. mainland can be detained there. That's something that happens before it, it gets its, its present day use. Um, and I think that a lot of the history of the U.S. colonial empire, as opposed to the history of the pointillist empire and the military bases, um, is a history of speculative speculative desires. Uh, but desires that don't always pan out. So there's this great enthusiasm at the end of the 19th century for the United States becoming a big colonial empire, for having Hawaii and the Philippines, and these will be uh, you know, highways to Asia and to trade with Japan and China. And that trade doesn't really become a huge thing. Uh, but nevertheless, in the same way that you can, you know, a couple can fall out of love but stay married, uh, a country can grow less imperialist or sort of lose its initial imperialist desire and, and remain an empire. And I think that's the history of, of the U.S. colonies, at least in the early 20th century. Um, they're, you know, they, they do have some kinds of uses for Washington, uh, but they are not the most useful parts of the country. Nevertheless, they're still part of it and a part of the country that is neglected that lives in the shadows. Um, but that could be a very weird part of the country to occupy. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, how like the guano islands um, um, oh, fall into yeah, that please. and that notion of appertaining, um, yeah. uh, the, it, which I found fascinating. Yeah. So what happens is there's a uh, agricultural crisis in the United States in the mid 19th century. And uh, the reason it's happening is, is, you know, kind of fairly predictable is that uh, if you grow food, uh, on a farm, again, you grow a cash crop. Right? So it could be grain, it could be cotton, it could be tobacco. But if you grow it again and again on the same plot of land and you keep selling it somewhere else, selling it somewhere else rather than consuming it nearby or consuming it on the land and then depositing the nutrients back in the land uh, through feces or just you know by putting the waste back on the land, uh, you end up depleting the soil. And particularly, you start running down uh, the soil's uh, nitrates, which are kind of hard to restore if you just keep you know, doing that year after year. Uh, so farmers get really nervous about finding some way to uh, replenish their parched farms. And the thing that does it is guano, which is um, – but guano can mean bird or bat feces used for fertilizer. But it turns out that this is the droppings of seabirds on these small – dry islands that don't see a lot of rain where the birds just land and you know uh they, they eat their anchovies and they land on the islands uh and then they defecate on the islands and then it just you know it just keeps piling up for years centuries millennia drying in the sun that stuff is a really useful fertilizer and so in the middle of the 19th century this is actually the first u.s overseas expansion uh the united states lays claim to nearly a hundred uninhabited guano islands and annexes them to the United States. And there's a Guano Island Act that's passed. And it says that these places will be, once they're sort of claimed and the claim is ratified, uh, they'll be appertaining to the United States, uh, which is a kind of a weird sort of language. But what it seems to say is that they're, they're fully part of the United States. Uh, now, that just that phrase, appertaining to the United States, uh, that's the legal foundation for the United States' overseas empire. That's the first time that the United States had annexed overseas territory. And there's a Supreme Court case about whether appertaining really – does that mean that this, these places are really part of the United States or not? And the Supreme Court decides yes. So uh, it's – it's, you know, these are just – you know, a hundred small uninhabited islands. They're quickly scraped free of guano. And then after that, they're not as useful anymore. Uh, but nevertheless, they are the, uh, the actual legal foundations for a much larger populous empire. Um, you know, one that includes, you know, up to 19 million people by the uh, eve of World War II. It's an amazing metaphor that our, our, our yeah. entire uh, empire, uh, uh, the, the project of the empire is literally built on mountains of crap. 
But yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, and and I'll just say one other thing. I mean, because we talked about the ways in which these these places can be useful and then not have an obvious use from the perspective of Washington, but you know, sort of develop one a little later. Uh, those guano islands, after the uh, guano is scraped off of them, uh, they sort of fall into disrepair or disuse. But then it turns out in the mid 20th century. For all of the reasons that they're interesting to birds as places to land, they're also really useful for places for airplanes to land. And then suddenly the guano islands become absolute, or at least some of them become absolutely essential to the U.S. military strategy. And it is with the guano islands that the United States fights World War II in the Pacific. Interesting. And let's talk about, let's move to the um, uh, the early 1900s when the Supreme Court does sort of make a distinction between uh, incorporated and unincorporated territories. What were the implications of that, and what, wh- wh- how, how much staying power did that have? Yeah, so it's a really interesting moment. So the United States has just acquired a number of populated territories. It's gutted Spain's empire in a war, and it's also taken Hawaii and American Samoa. And then there's this legal question of, well, what are these places? Are they part of the United States? And if so, how much are they part of the United States? Uh, you know, Are people who live in them automatically citizens? There's a law, it's called the 14th Amendment, that says if you're born in the United States, you're a U.S. citizen. Does that apply to Filipinos? Does the rest of the, does the Bill of Rights apply to Filipinos? Uh, So the Supreme Court argues it. And it's a, it's a contested thing. It's a, it's a very public thing, uh, these, these arguments. And uh, ultimately what the Supreme Court decides is that uh, there is a distinction. And it, this is a novel distinction. It wasn't one that had been around before, but the Supreme Court introduces it. There's a distinction between incorporated territories. Those territories are part of the United States in a constitutional sense. So those are the old Western territories. And they're also the two overseas territories that have the largest white populations, Hawaii and the Supreme Court decides Alaska. But all of the territories that the United States had claimed from Spain, which is where most of its colonial subjects live, those the Supreme Court decides are unincorporated territories, which means that they are part of the United States, but they're not part of the United States that's covered by the Constitution. Uh, and so that's why even today you can be born in American Samoa. Uh, you're born in the United States. No one disputes that. You have a U.S. passport. The stars and flags, uh, stars and stripes fly overhead. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, your U.S. passport does not say you're a U.S. citizen because the 14th Amendment doesn't extend to you. Uh, you're a U.S. national instead. I mean, the to put it in context, this is the same Supreme Court that basically said literacy uh, laws for voting were OK and uh, poll taxes were OK. I mean, the the, the agenda is pretty clear, right? Yeah. yeah and it's actually uh, nearly identical to the court. I mean, there's, I think, one member different uh, that uh, – decides the first of these cases, they're called the Insular cases, uh, that also decides Plessy v. Ferguson, which is the case that enshrines separate uh, but equal as a you know, constitutional way of running the country, which administratively divides the country into two in terms of uh, white and non-white. Uh, the Insular cases do something similar. They divide the uh, country into two in terms of a constitutional zone and an extra constitutional zone, and they also do it appealing to exactly the same logic you know, who's really part of the country and who's, for racial reasons, not quite really part of the country. The difference is this. Plessy v. Ferguson, I mean, that's recognized today as one of the sort of worst mistakes in the court's history, and it's been overturned. The insular cases are still good law. Yeah, well, I mean, Plessy v. Ferguson, we could be just a couple of years away from uh, from that uh, from that type of regime returning in some respects. Right? Maybe I'm overstating the case maybe a little bit, but... Uh, uh, certainly the Lochner era may be back uh, soon. But um, with that said, um, so this law, the, the, this, so how is it that, well, I mean, I guess it's, it's quite obvious why it's so durable, right? Is because, well, wh- why has that been so durable, I guess, is, is really what I'm asking. Uh, like, why, yeah. wh- wh- what were the forces that didn't allow Plessy v. Ferguson to stand, but, but allowed this to stand? Yeah, I think one difference is that um, the uh, Jim Crow was uh, it was a obviously a form of racist subordination, but it was also fairly public. Uh, you know, it was hard to not know that the country had a Jim Crow system uh, if you were living anywhere in the country uh, in the 20th century. Uh, nevertheless, it's been very easy 
not to really understand uh, the colonial system or even the fact of overseas territories if you live in the mainland part of the United States or if you have lived there in the 20th uh, and into the 21st century. So an example of this is even after Hurricane Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico and you know laid waste to the infrastructure of the island, uh, there was a you know and it made all the headlines. Uh, there was a national poll that asked people uh, in the mainland, "Are Puerto Ricans U.S. citizens?" And barely a majority of people, adults polled, were able to correctly say, "Yes, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens." And if you asked um, adults under 30, only 37% of them were able to uh, cough up that number. So I think one difference between the um, racist regime uh, that had applied to uh, African Americans is it was very much in the public view, whereas uh, the colonial forms of subordination and segregation, um, those, have, those have kind of happened off stage, uh, at least off stage from the perspective of the mainland. Uh, since we're talking about Puerto Rico, tell us the story of uh, Cornelius Rhodes, because that is. Um you know, we've talked on this program, uh, you know, that um, of, of the long history that the United States has had that in many respects is really um, um, one of, you know, uh, almost waging some type of war against Puerto Rico in one form or another. Uh, and Cornelius Rhodes, I think, sort of exemplifies that a little bit. Yeah, so I said that the, uh, you know, overseas parts of the United States are often off stage from the perspective of the mainland. And what's important to grasp is that all kinds of things can happen off stage that couldn't happen under the glare of the spotlights. And the Cornelius Rhodes story is a great example of that. So Cornelius Rhodes is a doctor. He's Harvard trained. Uh, he's from the mainland, but he goes to San Juan. He goes to Puerto Rico and he goes there to study anemia, with, uh, uh, um, a condition from which many uh, Puerto Ricans suffer. And so what does he do? Well, suddenly, this, you know, when he hits the island, he just becomes a very different kind of doctor. Uh, so first of all, he intentionally refuses treatment to some of his patients just to see what will happen. Uh, he tries to induce disease in other of his patients also to see what will happen. He describes patients such as this to his colleagues as experimental animals. Uh, and then he writes a letter. He writes one of the most extraordinary letters that I've read as a historian, uh, where he writes to a colleague, to a Boston colleague, and he you know, starts off, it's a very chatty letter, and he said, um, you know, how are you? Hope everyone's well. Well, here's some gossip about the field. And then he says, oh, and me, Puerto Rico, you know, I'm in Puerto Rico. It's beautiful. The island is great. Uh, the only problem is the Puerto Ricans. They're awful. They're filthy. They steal. Uh, frankly, they're, they're the worst. And uh, the best thing for Puerto Rico, he goes on to say, would be a total extermination of the population. And then he says, in fact, I've started it. I have killed eight of my patients and I've tried to transplant cancer. Turns out it's very hard to transplant cancer, but he doesn't know that. Uh, I've tried to transplant cancer into 13 others. Uh, you know, hope your wife's well, uh, all, all best. And, and it's, it's an incredible letter, right? Because he just confessed to, it seems like he's confessed to murdering eight people. Uh, and extraordinarily, the letter gets found by the Puerto Rican hospital staff, and it becomes a major scandal in Puerto Rico. Of course it does. Uh, there's, a, there's an investigation by the government. Uh, that investigation uncovers yet another letter, which the, government, uh, the governor describes as worse than the first, which is kind of impossible to imagine for me. Uh, but nevertheless, the government uh, destroys that second letter. So we've never seen it as historians uh, and, and concludes that he wasn't really serious about what he said. He didn't really kill eight people. Uh, and extraordinarily, Cornelius Rhodes is able to just leave. He doesn't face any kind of trial. He just he doesn't even lose his job. Uh, he just goes back to the mainland. What happens in San Juan stays in San Juan. Uh, and then his medical career takes off. Uh, now, it does. I mean, what's amazing about the story is that in itself would be incredible, but it doesn't end because uh, as his medical career takes off, he becomes the vice president of the New York Academy of Medicine. He goes into the army. And while he's in the army, he oversees a or he's a chief medical officer in a large scale series of uh, tests of chemical weapons on U.S. service members. So U.S. service members are have uh, toxic agents applied to their skin to see what happens. Many of them suffer permanent damage. They're put in gas chambers with gas masks to see what will happen. Uh, some of them are put out in jungles and told to fight while they're gassed from overhead. A lot of those people 
are also Puerto Rican. And Cornelius Rhodes is right there in the middle of it, writing up reports. Does black skin blister differently than white skin? Cornelius Rhodes will let you know. Uh, you know, he gets a medal for this. Uh, and then as a result of those experiments, uh, he, one of the things they figure out is that some of these um, toxic agents are actually good at fighting cancer. And Cornelius Rhodes uses that to uh, become in the third phase of his career, the first head of the Sloan Kettering Institute, uh, and basically one of the pioneers of chemotherapy. And that's what he's remembered for for decades on the U.S. mainland as a medical hero, the, you know, the father of chemotherapy. And it really takes an extraordinarily long time before Puerto Ricans are able to get the message out that this guy who's been on the cover of Time magazine as a hero is actually the sort of like Mengele of Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and I mean, for me, that's, that's kind of the, 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 that's the final extraordinary bit is that the informational segregation is so tight uh, that it takes decades for Puerto Ricans to effectively, uh, you know, do something about the fact that Cornelius Rose is being celebrated, openly celebrated as a hero on the mainland. Uh, and the people who are celebrating him have no idea what he was up to in Puerto Rico. Uh, that that story is just so nuts, um, man. But it it really yeah, it does really is. it does capture. I mean, it is it's almost the perfect metaphor in some respects, right? I mean, that is um, the the extraction or the uh, the oppression ends up, you know, fueling on some level at different times um, uh, the expansion and the, the you know, the success uh, uh, of the country in some fashion. Um, and then, um, you know, we don't have too much time left here, but it w the, the, the nature of the empire changes to being um, less colonial and, and in many respects more like, um, like, would you call it, Sort of through, via influence, or I mean, maybe the 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 Hoover uh, screws story sort of is is a good metaphor for this. Yeah, so the, I think there are two things that happen um, uh, as the United States, you know, gets through World War II, it becomes the most powerful country in the world. And it has the option militarily. I mean, it, it physically can do this. It has the option of uh, doing what Britain had done, which is expressing its power by taking a lot of colonies and controlling a lot of the land of the planet. Right at the end of World War II, the United States actually has, in occupied zones mainly, uh, and, in, and colonies, which is a slightly lesser number, it has more people who are under U.S. jurisdiction, uh, who are uh, living outside of the mainland, than who are living in all of the states. I mean, that's how much land the United States briefly controls at the end of World War II. And so then it faces an interesting question. Is, does, is it want to be Britain again? Does it want to sort of do that whole thing and, and claim colonies and annex Japan and all that kind of stuff? And it doesn't. Uh, and, you know, it still has a colonial empire. They, there are still five inhabited territories of the United States today, and millions of people live in them. Uh, but nevertheless, the United States sort of pivots away. Uh, one thing is it does is it seeks to find ways to... Um, influence outside of its borders, uh, to extend its and project power, not by extending its borders, by annexing new places, but by controlling processes in foreign countries. Uh, but undergirding that, and this is what I focus on particularly, uh, is that the United States does this not by abjuring territory entirely, but by claiming just a bunch of small territorial points. Uh, and by a bunch, I mean literally hundreds. That's the number of foreign military bases that the United States has. But these points act as sort of staging grounds and beacons uh, and, and just little uh, sort of uh, connectors that allow the United States to spread a much more diffuse influence out throughout the world, uh, which is still undergirded by some sort of territorial component, um, but a territorial footprint that I think looks more pointillist than colonial. I mean, it's almost like um, it's almost like the like the web, like a series of servers. We have something like uh, nearly 800 uh, bases across the country. I mean, across the world. Yeah. Um, it's a network. Right. Um, and and how does that is that is that is, is the the influence there exclusively um, uh is it projecting power from a military standpoint? Like these are, you know, we have the high ground in these 800 places or, or, or we have control of, you know, it need be, you know, the harbor. Or is it also a, um, a, a cultural one, too? Yes. What's I, what I think is so interesting about the bases is that their purpose is military. 
That's what they're there for. That's why we call them military bases. Uh, but that's not all they do, because you have to imagine these places as little, or in some cases actually not so little, enclaves that are full of people from the United States. And there's all kind of interesting contacts between people on the base, often who have quite a lot of money compared to the uh, surrounding region and the people around it. So in the book, I tell the story about the complicated interactions that people who are on base have with folks who are living in the shadow of the bases. Uh, and it actually becomes a really important vector for the spread of U.S. culture. So one of the questions I take up in my book is, why does Liverpool become this sort of world city of pop? Like, why is there so much? We know about the Beatles, but, you know, the, like the bench is like 500 bands deep. There's a lot of, you know, bands that like were pointed in the direction of the Beatles. You know, we're doing that kind of music and they're all coming out of the Liverpool area. And why is that? Uh, because Liverpool hadn't habitually been uh, the major city for pop music uh, in Britain. And the answer is that, you know, Liverpool is in the shadow of the single largest U.S. Air Force base in Europe, uh, this base called Burtonwood. And it's really clear that not just the Beatles, but all these other bands are kind of subsisting on, I mean, you know, these guys in the base who are very rich, who are going out into the clubs at night, who are demanding U.S. style rock uh, and, you know, Ringo's stepdad works on the base, makes his money there, and gets all these records as a result of working there that he gives to Ringo. Uh, John's mom is a, what's called a good time girl, so she, I imagine she's spending some time with the guys from the bases. She also has an incredibly up-to-date record collection, uh, and that's that's how Paul gets his records too. Uh, and George sort of steals them from the local record shop, which is also bristling with all kinds of like really good what they then called race records, which are African American uh, records of African American music, and all of that's coming from the portal of the base where there's just all this money there's all this glamour and there are all these guys sort of you know waiting to spread it around for willing young teenagers who can play u.s style rock so it's not entirely surprised that the liverpool area becomes an area sort of where rock takes off uh because these bases are you know in some ways little just portals of the united states and little portals not just of u.s military power but of u.s uh, you know, industrial standards and, and, and culture and, and all in language and all these other things that come with the United States that seep through the portal as well. Well, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I wish we had uh, more time to get to, um, the, uh, the, the standardization of, of screws, screws which I right. found fascinating and, uh, longtime listeners of, uh, of, of this program will remember the story of the Northern Mariana Islands and Jack Abramoff and Tom DeLay and uh, how they would yeah. visit that in the mid-aughts um, as a way of basically getting um, made-in-USA uh, goods uh, by basically near-slave labor, practically. But um, there's, there's a lot more in here. How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States. Daniel Imavart, thank you so much for your time today. We will put a link at majority.fm of your book. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure to be on. All right, folks. We got to uh, take a break, head into the uh, fun half of the program, wherein we will have uh, more fun, uh, uh, more fun than we really uh, should be allowed to have. Uh, a close-up uh, video of Seb Gorka talking to Michelle Bachman. Uh, that's always uh, fun. Um, also, uh, we're gonna we have, have Real Kana fighting a coup. Oh, is it we do? New, okay. Some new sound coming. Okay, great. Um, we have, um, oh, Joe Biden talking about uh, his, his, new, uh, his new slogan. Um, we have uh, a, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is an, you know, an interesting sort of um, misreporting on, uh, on both uh, Biden's support with minority voters and really sort of uh, gender splits in donations. Uh, coming from MSNBC. And, of course, um, Stephen Moore's last-ditch effort to argue that he is better than Herman Cain. All this and uh, more. Just the, overwhelmed by the ideas. Yeah, can we play that drop? Uh, just because it's we've, we've contemplated um, one day coming into work and just instead of actually doing a show, just play this one clip from Dave Rubin over and over again. I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. 
I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode. There you go. Same. It's I'm almost, starting to, you know what? It's almost it's better, hypnotic. though, when you can see his face, though, because he is saying this without any sense of, like, this is a weird thing to say. Uh, oh, he's taking it in. He's so he's so literally proud. taking in so. Many uh, that was prompted by a conversation he listened to between the Weinstein brothers. So, how many times has he I had know, the Weinstein like brothers? Literally, on? I mean, many, something like how many times has he had those? You know, like, 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 these two guys who no one's ever heard of, like the greatest thinkers in the history of, of the world. I don't know. Let me search my uh, Ruben Report podcast feed. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Rubin's gay. No, my mind's blown by so many high-level ideas. Folks, just a reminder, you can support this program by becoming a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. And when you do, not only do you support the, um, the daily free show, but you also get extra content virtually every single day. Uh, you make this show possible uh, so if you've been thinking about joining, please do. And, of course, if you do not have the financial means uh, but you want access to the fun half, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Wait an inordinately long period of time for us to go through the emails. It takes us a long time. Uh, but we will get there, and we will work out a deal for you, I promise. Uh, also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Uh, Today is Tuesday. On Tuesdays, uh, what happens is day turns into night, and then in Tuesday nights... And then high-level ideas. High-level ideas happen. (laughs) When your brain has recovered. (laughs) It may bring us to recover from the majority report. (laughs) 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 Sorry, I can't take it. Um, Tonight, uh, Dr. Maitha Al-Hassan, we're talking about the uprisings in Algeria and the Sudan through the lens of Malcolm X and uh, his relation to Africa, the Middle East, and liberation. Anna Kasparian is coming in studio, and we are going to dunk on Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg. Uh, Lula de Silva did a really important interview. We're going to talk about that and, of course, the coup in Venezuela. So a ton of stuff tonight. And at 6 o'clock... As if that wasn't enough, a special live stream on the Spanish election results with Nando Vila on the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. So six and seven, Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel, patreon.com slash TMBS for the whole thing this weekend, an illicit history of humanitarian law. Jamie, the Intifada. This week on the Antifada, we have released the very first edition of a new side project called Prolet Cult that AP Andy is doing. For our patrons, it's about UFOs, conspiracy theories, space news, and the paranormal, but from a Marxist perspective. So check that out if you're a patron, or this might be a good time to join. Also, uh, Sean spoke with a guy from Means TV over the weekend. That's going to be out in our free episode later this week. And we still have our episode from last week where we talked to George Chicarello Mar about the coup in Venezuela, which seems very relevant in light of the news coming out of Venezuela now um, and lots of other luminaries of the left. So check it out. Matt? On YouTube, uh, episode 20 of Literary Hangover, Looking Back on the Spanish War, an essay by George Orwell, uh, is available. For patrons, there's another essay on the same topic by the same guy. Uh, It's called Spilling the Spanish Beans by George Orwell when he was fresh from the Spanish Civil War, healing from his throat wound, and he was pissed off that he was called a Trotsky fascist in Spain, and he sort of explains what that's about. Uh, Lots of ideas. That's Yeah, you... (laughs) There's too many ideas in Spain. Too many ideas. There's a lot of ideas in Spain. So it's kind of hard to keep track here of all the ideas. I don't know enough about Franco, but I do know that he's he's re- he's really into markets. Franco? Not getting into, the SJWs yeah, out of the he's schools. Getting the SJ, literally getting the SJWs out of the schools. Uh, what are your thoughts on Spanish leader Franz Franco? I don't know. There's a lot coming up. And right J.S. Nin and uh, Trotsky. What, were the, what was the deal with those two guys? <laughs> 
All right, we'll see you in the fun half, 646-257-3920.